Hey guys, it's Emac here. Today we're going to talk about OCP Java certification exam. I'm going to walk you through all the things that you need to know in order to become successful and pass this exam. First of all, the exam is 85 questions and you get 150 minutes. Uh, that means you have around uh, two minutes, under two minutes to comprehend, to read the question, understand and pick the right answers. Of course, this is a bumpy road. I'm going to help you pass this exam as soon as possible. So what you need to understand is this exam is a pro level. In order to pass this OCP Java certification program, you definitely need to uh, first pass OCA. Java 8 certification. But why certification is important? If you ask me, uh, certifications are important because uh, that way you can validate your knowledge and employees when uh, when they look for you know, a new person to, to join to their team. Basically, they look for qualified people. There are two ways in general you can uh, kind of prove your ability working with the technology or programming languages. Uh, one is through just contributing to an open source project. And the other one is by basically getting certified. When you're a certified programmer, nobody's going to question your ability. They're just going to you know, assume that you're good at it. Of course, they're going to ask questions, but uh, basically the, it gives them peace of mind and you know, kind of confidence in your uh, technical abilities. So the cost of the exam is 245 bucks, but if you're thinking about that six-figure job, uh, this is the right way. This is the right spending for you at this time. Uh, if when you get certified, uh, you basically become eligible to apply for those high paying jobs. So uh, you can uh, schedule the exam on education.oracle.com. Again, uh, 85 questions, 150 minutes. I'm going to walk you through all the mental preparation and technical preparation of this tough exam. So one thing uh, you need to understand is in time management, when you set an exam and some people, they just keep uh, checking the clock and somehow they get distracted, which is not a good thing. I never recommend this. Don't uh, panic. Don't uh, check the time, you know, constantly uh, have a kind of like mental model. For example, let's say, okay, at question number 42, if I have like 70 uh, for 75 minutes, that means I'm on the right path. If not, then you have to increase your pace. Otherwise you can give yourself more time, but don't check the clock constantly. Uh, make sure you get enough sleep the night before of the exam because your mind uh, needs to have enough energy uh, and capacity to, to basically perform. So these are the things that as far as, you know, having the right mindset in sitting in the exam, in any exam, uh, you want to make sure you have this skill of time, managing your time and also how to answer the questions. Let's say you get a question, it's question number two and you don't know the answer. Uh, don't get stuck. Don't spend five minutes on that question. Just mark it as soon as possible and move on because uh, you can spend your time on the question that you are, you know, for sure you're going to get the right answer. Don't get stuck, move on and you can come back uh, before finishing the exam. So there's one book you need uh, for the certification and it's OCP uh, Java certification book. Uh, this is a great book. It comes with 10 uh, chapter and there's a reason for every single one. I'm going to walk you through all the tips that it's going to help you become successful in this exam. Let's get started. So the first thing I mentioned, um, it, it's about time management. But the second thing is before doing mock tests, don't schedule your exam. Uh, when you finish the book, when you do practice, you know, on a daily basis, at the end, you want to make sure that you're good at uh, you know, doing exams and the way you can find out uh, is just by doing mock tests. They're much cheaper. I don't know if uh, maybe 10, 15 bucks, you can get few exams and then you can practice, make sure you get maybe around 70 or more because you're going to need at least 65% uh, percent for this exam uh, in order to uh, pass. So the first one is about uh, advanced class design. So in advanced class design, you want to make sure you have a good understanding about access modifiers public, private, protected, and package protected. So these are the access modifiers that Java uses. And make sure you practice all the code in a notepad, not in a standard IDE like IntelliJ or Eclipse or Visual Studio Code, because the IntelliSense is going to basically give you an idea about the code. You don't want that in the exam. You're going to just get a piece of code and you need to understand that how this code works. So practice everything in notepad, then copy and paste it to your uh, to your IDE and, and run it, see if it runs. Uh, if you haven't watched my OCA exam, 
a preparation for Java, you can, uh, you know, click on it. The link is under underneath in the description section and you can click on it and uh, you can learn about other tips about OCA. What you've done, if you have done OCA and you already certified, now you're uh, ready for uh, being basically professional Java developer. This is the video you want to continue watching. So um, the second part in the advanced class design, it's about enums. You're going to get at least one or two questions about enum. They're going to try to modify the enum values during runtime. That code uh, won't compile. It's not going to work, right? You're going to get runtime exception. You're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to compare enum values with integers in, for example, a switch or select case. So there are, uh, you know, quite a few tricks in, in enums. Make sure you understand those access modifiers. You're going to definitely get questions about access modifiers, overloading and overwriting. Make sure you understand the equal and hash code, this method signatures, and, uh, you know, uh, you, you need to have a good understanding about how to overwrite and overload the methods and make sure you know how to overwrite those famous methods like equal, hash code, two string. Uh, remember those method signatures. So this is the first section. This, the next section is about uh, basically design patterns. Design pattern is actually a very important concept uh, if you're working as a, a pro software engineer. Uh, we have a lot of uh, different uh, design patterns and the best book of course is gang of four that walks you through all the famous design patterns but for the exam make sure you're very comfortable with single tone single tone is basically make sure that you only have one instance of a class running in your application for example your application configuration your application logger you don't want to create keep creating instances off of this class you only need one instance that basically uh, about returns the instance that you already created when you launch the application and you can use the same instance. You're not allowed to create objects. And the way you do that, you make the uh, basically constructor private and you create a public static final uh, variable that returns the instance of that class. The next part is about generics and uh, collections. Collections, they feature a lot. Uh, you will see them everywhere in the exam. So make sure you have a good understanding about array, array list, map, set, tree. So uh, a hash map, for example, stores the, uh, the key, uh, keys in the hash table. Uh, one thing that's very important and you're going to get probably one or two questions, it's about comparable vs comparator. So comparable impl implements uh, compare to method. Uh, on the other side, comparator only implements compare. So they're going to mix those concepts and try to get you to pick the wrong answer. So make sure you don't fall for this practice comparator and comparable, basically how to compare two objects, how to compare two, you know, person, two employees, two objects together, right? This is the method that you, uh, this is the interface basically you implement comparable, for example. Uh, binary search, uh, you got to know that uh, binary search works on uh, sorted areas. If the areas is not sorted, it's going to return an unpredictable result. Upper bounded and lower bounded, you uh, make use of diamond operator uh, and learn how to implement uh, basically generic classes, generic interfaces and methods. Uh, the next section is about uh, Java basically functional interfaces. I cannot emphasize this part enough. You're going to get a lot of questions regarding functional interfaces. You need to know we have a bunch of functional interfaces. Uh, for example, you have predicate, you have by predicate, you have function, by function, you have consumer, uh, you have supplier. So these are the functional interfaces that Java 8 introduces. And you uh, have to make sure that you're very comfortable with the single uh, abstract method that they provide and also the return time. For example, predicate returns the Boolean type. This is the only functional interface that returns Boolean. You need to know that. And the method that implements is called test. Basically, let's say you have a bunch of people in an array list and you want to check their salaries. And if they meet the condition, they you want to return the uh, value. So you use predicate because it returns Boolean. It basically checks the condition to make sure, you know, it satisfies the condition that you provide. So in those cases, you have to use predicate. So the next chapter is about the uh, string and localization. You're going to get at least two questions about, uh, you know, resource bundle. They're going to pick a language or country and they're going to ask you which property file will be picked during the runtime. Uh, 
Uh, you have to know the difference between period, duration. You, know, you have to know that you're not allowed to chain them uh, method on, for example, on period. And if you do, uh, the, the last item, the last function that you apply will be basically in effect. The other ones will be ignored. There are tricks in you know working with date and time, but you need to understand about daylight saving that, for example, if it's March and then you add, uh, for example, an hour to 1.30 a.m., instead of being 2.30, it will be 3.30 a.m. So make sure you practice daylight saving. You're probably going to get at least one or two questions about daylight saving and one or two questions about uh, resource bundle. You're not allowed to create a new uh, date object. For example, local date uh, D equal to new local date that doesn't compile. So you're not allowed to create. There's no constructor for date time uh, in Java. The next section is about exceptions. Try and catch, you know, try either catch or finally. So they're going to trick you, you know, using and removing one of those. Make sure you don't fall for it. Practice enough on try and catch. It's actually a common great practice in any programming language to uh, basically capture the exceptions. There's a new concept called try with resources where you can create a new object in a try block without having finally or uh, catch, right? So this is a new concept. But one thing you need to know that this method implements a, a auto closable method that you need to basically look into. If that method handling an exception, and if you are using try with resources, you need to make sure that you declare or handle that exception. Check exceptions, you need to declare them or handle them. On the other side, runtime exceptions, they're just exception and you don't need to declare or handle them. It's very, uh, you know, clear, uh, but make sure you have a good understanding about exceptions. Assertions, it's another way of checking or basically when you are testing your application, they're very useful. Make sure you have a good understanding about assertion because you're going to get at least one or two questions regarding assertion. The next chapter is about uh, multi-threading and concurrency. So you need to understand how threads work in Java. Uh, for example, if you want to do multiple things at the same time, we use multi-threading, uh, but sometimes in exam they create it, but they don't start it. You need to know how, to, how the life cycle works, how to start a thread, what's the difference between runnable and callable. Make sure you know that there's an exam question regarding runnable and uh, callable. Uh, so cyclic barrier, it's a basically barrier that all the uh, threads, they need to kind of wait at that point and they need to reach that in order to program uh, to proceed. Uh, so uh, executor service, make sure you, know, you understand how to submit a task to executor service, uh, make sure how you can wait for a task to finish and how to shut it down and how the life cycle works in general. You have a new concept called parallel streams where you can basically execute multiple tasks using Java parallel stream, but the result and the order is kind of not predicted. You don't know which one is going to start first and you know finish first. This is something internally managed by Java, but there are some workarounds that you can make that happen. Definitely make sure you have a good understanding about fork join framework in recursive task and action task. Make sure the methods that they implement, you know, the return type, you know how to implement them. So fork join is basically a concept of divide and conquer. You can divide a big task in smaller tasks and have them yeah, and run them one by one. And then at the end, merge the result and return it to the user. You can multitask this. Uh, synchronization, I cannot emphasize this enough. You as a programmer, you need to understand how synchronization work and why we do it. For example, if you're transferring money from account A to account B, you need to synchronize this method because if there's an online you know, request, let's say you're doing online shopping at the same time you're transferring money between your accounts. So one of them need to wait until the other one is finished because otherwise your balance will be uh, basically wrong. So this is how this is the situation. We need to use synchronization. We need to basically block the method and kind of lock it. Uh, so other threads cannot access it while we are operating or, uh, you know, arithmetic functions or any other thing that we are doing. So make sure you have a good understanding about synchronization because you're going to get a bunch of questions regarding synchronization. Uh, the next part is about IO and NIO2. NIO2 is basically a 
uh, new framework in Java 8, and I.O. is just a traditional Java input output. Make sure you uh, understand file input string, file output string, file writer, file reader, how to write and read information to a file. In NIO2, uh, make sure you're uh, comfortable with absolute and relative paths. Um, understand the sub path. You're going to get definitely question on sub path and normalize and resolve. Definitely, there are probably two, three questions regarding uh, this uh, methods that I just mentioned. So when you read the files content, uh, uh, there are two methods. Basically, one of them is file.read all, all lines, which returns a list. Remember, and the second one is files.lines, which returns a stream. So they're going to kind of confuse you by kind of applying the stream to a list, which is not going to compile and vice versa. Uh, the last section is about JDBC. In JDBC, uh, they're going to test your knowledge on connectivity to database. You need to uh, have a good understanding about statement. The format of connection string, they're going to change it and they're going to basically use, for example, uh, semicolon instead of colon in your uh, you know, URL, make sure you have a good understanding about the format. Um, execute the difference between execute and the return type, execute query and return type. You're going to get at least three or four questions on JDBC. So Java 8 is still relevant in the US because a lot of companies are still working with Java 8 in the United States because uh, Java 8 introduced a lot of new features that companies implemented. Uh, the, basically uh, adopted the knowledge and technology. Now they're looking for a lot of people to maintain and expand their code on Java 8. The reason Java 8 uh, companies don't just upgrade immediately, there are two major reasons. One is they don't want to just uh, be the early adopter because of the, any potential, you know, bug or problem. And the second thing, it does cost a lot of money and knowledge, local knowledge in any company to upgrade the code. So they want to, they do it always in a pace that's they're comfortable. So Java 8 is still relevant. It's still very popular. A lot of companies still use Java 8 and they have existing code bases. So if you become certified in uh, OCP uh, or professional level of Java, uh, you have a high chance of you know joining one of those great teams. So uh, I hope you guys uh, like this video. If you haven't subscribed to my channel, please subscribe. Don't forget to like this video and I hope to see you soon. Thanks. Bye.